Good to see you this morning. We're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 5. I'm all out of breath. <laughs> Love a worship service like that. Nehemiah chapter 5 this morning. Good to see you all. Glad you're here today. We have learned thus far in the book of Nehemiah that because of the sin of God's people, constantly, repeatedly turning away from God, doing their own thing, ignoring the scriptures, ignoring the prophets who came with messages from God, apostasy in, in a word, uh, led them into captivity where God finally said enough was enough, and the Babylonians came in and overthrew the southern kingdom, Judah, 70-year captivity. At the end of those 70 years, Cyrus, as was prophesied hundreds of years before by Isaiah the prophet, uh, Cyrus decreed that the Jews could go back to their homeland and rebuild. Rebuild their city of Jerusalem, rebuild their temple. And 92 years or so later, we read in Nehemiah, we understand that um, things weren't going very well. The walls were still torn down. The, the gates still charred from all those many years ago from the destruction. And the people were in fear and in trouble because of the nations around them. And so God used Nehemiah to go back. He opened the door through his gracious work in the king's heart, allowing Nehemiah to go back and do this work. We learned that the work was extensive. That was a lot of rubble. We're not talking about a little, a little stone wall around your house in the front yard. All right? We're talking about walls for security and safety. Walls that had been completely torn down. A lot of rubble. A lot of work. And we learned that in addition to the extensive work, there was opposition. The people who, of course, uh, did not like the Jews, the people who were keeping those who had already returned in fear and oppression, when they heard Nehemiah had come with orders from the king to help him rebuild, they were not happy at all. And so we've learned what to do in these situations. We've made some practical applications in our lives. But when we get to Nehemiah chapter 5, we have a new situation. We have a new circumstance that arises. Let me, let me just say this. When you're walking with God, when you are trying to do a work for God, whatever that is, you're just trying to live for the Lord, stuff's going to come from every angle. All right? And just when you think you, all right, I'm, I'm all set over here, whew, something else comes along. And, uh, but that's okay. That's just part of the program. And that's part of the spiritual growth. That's part of learning and, and growing and walking more closely with the Lord. And that's what happens here in Nehemiah chapter 5. And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. All right, So we had, we had opposition from without. Now we've got some problems within. For there were those who said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses, that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards, yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children, and indeed we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards." And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, Each of you is exacting usury, that's charging interest, 
from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them, and I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren, or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please let us stop this usury. Restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses. Also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine and the oil that you have charged them. So they said, we will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests. Here's accountability, ladies and gentlemen. Then I called the priests and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, Twelve years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine beside forty shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued the work on this wall and I did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers, besides those who came to us from the nations around us. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowl were prepared for me, and once every ten days, an abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions because the bondage was heavy on this people. Remember me, my God, for good according to all that I have for this people. Please understand that opposition can be overcome and can even spur the work of God forward. But sin will always hinder it. Sin will always be a wet blanket on the fire of the Spirit. Why? Because sin deters God's blessings, sin damages our relationships, and sin diminishes our testimony. That's what we just read. That's what we just saw. And those of you who have been around church for any length of time understand this to be true. We see it going on in churches today. And God cannot honor it. Here was the problem. The people didn't have money for food or taxes. Now listen, the king's not going to say, oh, you can't pay the taxes? That's okay. I mean, if you live in a place like that, I'm moving when I retire. I'm going to where you are. That just doesn't happen. And the reason they didn't have the money to feed their large families, that's what the first complaint was. We've got, a, we've got big families. We can't feed them. We can't pay for food or taxes because all of our land, our vineyards, our, our farms, they're all mortgaged. And the interest rates are so high, we can't pay everything off. And, and some said, we're even selling our sons and daughters into slavery to try to pay our debt, and we can't redeem them because we're broke, because the interest rates are so high. The problem was, the, and, and we also saw that there was a famine in the land. Here's the problem. It was greed by God's people, against God's people, that was causing oppression. Greed. Folks, listen. 
When I put money first, I put myself first, and I put God and everyone else behind me. Paul wrote this to Timothy. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. How much truth is there in that? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. We just see that unfolding all around us, don't we? All around us. Matthew Henry wrote this, Nehemiah knew that if he built Jerusalem's walls ever so high, so thick, and so strong, the city could not be safe while there were abuses. And you see, the abuse was this. It was a direct violation of the Mosaic law, the law of God through Moses, for the Jews to be uh, lending money with interest to their Jewish brothers and sisters and taking their children as slaves. They could do that for the foreigners, God said, but they weren't supposed to do it against their brothers and sisters. And these people were doing it anyway. Think about this. It's this kind of behavior and other types of, of, of egregious violations of the Word of God that put them in that situation in the first place. And now there's somebody who's come back to say, hey, God is giving us another chance to do this and do it right. And these people said, ah, well, you know, person's got to make a living. We see an opportunity to make a buck. Who can blame, that? Who can blame anybody for that? Well, God did. God did. Folks, when there's... Where there's sin, there's conflict. And where there's conflict, there's sin. Remember that. Only by pride comes contention. And pride is sin. Pride is putting yourself first. Conflict nearly stopped the work. And I say to you today that sin within the church cripples it. The late, great J. Vernon McGee one time said, in the history of the church, we've seen that when the devil couldn't destroy the church by persecution, the next thing he did was to join it. <laughs> All right, I can tell some of you, yeah, it's a rough morning. <laughs> I want you to understand as we look at this idea of when there's sin within, do this. Following Nehemiah's example, what should we do when there's sin within? I just want you to know that I'm not preaching to anybody in particular. There's nothing going on that I know of unless God knows of something and His timing is always right and always good. I'm just preaching through the book of Nehemiah. Okay? Good. All right. So don't be looking at the person next to you unless you know something. And if you know something, nudge them. <laughs> what do we do? First thing we do is point out the offense. Point out the offense. It's what Nehemiah did. Now let me just hasten to say this. Be sure it's actually a biblical problem. Pet peeves and strong convictions are not necessarily Bible doctrine. I don't know how many times I've heard over the years, well, that's your preference, but this is my conviction. Like your conviction trumps my preference? If my preference is based on the Word of God and your conviction is just a strong feeling, guess what? That, you, you see what I'm saying? Let's make sure that we... If, if there's an offense, it is a biblical offense. Nehemiah had every right to say something to these people because they were violating the clear 
black and white word of God, violating the law. And he says, what you're doing is not good. Let's be careful these days. I know that there are people who they see some things and they go, well, I, I don't know about that. And they reference the law when we're living in the age of grace. Be careful. Be careful. All right? Now, the moral law has, is always the same. And let's be careful of that. Because we're living in a time when those who claim to be Christians, who claim to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and believe the Word of God are living morally in a way that God says they're not to. And I don't know about you, but I can really, I, I can very easily come up with excuses for my behavior. Why what I'm doing is okay. I can justify it, but not when I, when I hold it up next to the Word of God. Let's be people of the book. Be sure it's a biblical problem. And then, before we point out the offense, let's examine ourselves first. Remember, uh, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7. He says, why are you pointing out that little bit of sawdust in your brother's eye when you've got a two-by-four? Of course, that's my version, okay? When you, a speck in your brother's eye when you've got a plank. How can you say, here, let me help you remove that, that speck when you've got a plank in your eye? He said, first thing you need to do is remove the plank from your eye before you can even approach your brother. Boy, that's sound advice. I've learned over the years that I have plenty in my own eye to take care of. And let me encourage you. Now remember what I'm saying. Please don't take things out of context. There are things in the Word of God, do and don't. Black and white. All right? Sin and righteousness. It's all there. It's all there. But when it comes to personal offenses, when it comes to feeling like somebody has done me wrong, what did Jesus say in Matthew 18 about overlooking and forgiving? When Peter, all spiritual, said, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother when he offends me? Up to seven times? Right? Because the... Because the the religious leaders taught three strikes and you're out. You forgive three times and then you treat them like uh, you, you treat them like a, a heathen. Seven times, Lord? Jesus said, no. Seventy times seven. Seventy times seven. Let's be people who forgive, who overlook. Now, uh, I'm not. Yeah, you've got to protect yourself because there are some people who will take advantage of that and they'll treat you like a doormat. And wherever you want to draw that line, that's between you and God. But you still forgive. You still overlook. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, one believer sues another and right in front of unbelievers. Even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. Why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourselves be cheated? <laughs> what? No way! I've got my rights. Right? So be sure it's a biblical problem. And then... When you're pointing out the offense, be sure it's biblically performed. Do it right. I like what Nehemiah wrote here in, in, in verses uh, uh, 6 and 7. He, he said, um, And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words, after serious thought. I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> 
Nehemiah thought about it first. You know, we're, we shoot first and think later, right? We, we, bah, we spew, and then we think about it later and go, hmm, maybe I was a little too hard. Maybe I was not, not, not right in the first place. Nehemiah thought about it. Now, he knew that they were wrong. He knew that God's word must prevail, but he also knew that there's a right way to handle things and a wrong way to handle things. I wish I could tell you that over the course of my ministry, I handled every situation the way Nehemiah did. And then I would have to ask you to forgive me for lying. I have failed many times. But I've learned. Give it some thought. Think before you speak. You know Proverbs 29.20 says there's more hope for a fool than for someone who speaks without thinking? (laughs) And all I see today across our landscape, online, right, at social media, in the media, right, people speaking before they think. And it's this word vomit many times. And it's like, really? Really? I don't know. I've told Lynn one time, I, I, I wish I could get paid as much money as some of these people get paid for saying dumb things. I mean, I'll take half. Why not? It's like, come on. So think before you speak, and then talk discreetly versus publicly. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Nehemiah called this great assembly and called these people out in front. Let's talk about that. Now, I read in Matthew 18 that Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. I have a prayer request for the group. It grieves me to no end that so-and-so did thus and so to me. Please pray for them. Oh, stop. Stop the gossip. Stop being the martyr, and do what Jesus said. Go to so-and-so and and say, hey, just want to talk to you about something. You may not even realize, but I was offended by this or by that. And Jesus said, if your brother hears you, you've gained your brother. That's cool. That's good. Now, Nehemiah did something very publicly, and and we have some scriptural uh, um, backing for that as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, where, where Paul wrote, Those who continue to sin rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Sometimes... Sometimes people don't want to listen. They don't want to do what's right. They just want to do their own thing. And there are times when a public rebuke is necessary. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Right? A little bit of sin spreads. Listen, you know, we're seeing today in our nation, it's, it's, almost, it's mind-boggling to many of us that people are getting away with unthinkable crimes. And it's like, okay, just don't do it again, please. And if they do it again, oh, well, don't do it again, please. And it's like, what? So you know what happens people begin to think it's okay. It doesn't matter. It's okay to do these things. And if sin is not confronted, it will spread like that. And sin 
that is not confronted within a congregation of believers will end up corrupting that congregation. And so we, you know, as a pastor, I'm always very aware of that. Think before you speak, talk discreetly versus publicly, and target reconciliation. Tell it to your brother, and if your brother hears you, you've gained your brother. It's been my experience over the years that when I go to somebody one-on-one, oftentimes, many times, most times, the relationship is strengthened after that. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So point out the offense is the first step. The second step is this, pursue repentance. Pursue repentance. Remember, we're talking about when there's sin within. This is what to do. When you have recognized a brother or sister in Christ who is living in sin openly against the Word of God, you say, that in, in a church? Please. Been around the block a few times. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing to me. And yet, yes, yes. Pursue repentance and you ought to be motivated by, and the repentance ought to be motivated by, the fear of God. Did you notice that twice? In verse 9 and verse 15, Nehemiah brought up the fear of God. Should we not live in the fear of God? He said, those who, who were in charge before I got here, they did all these things. They even oppressed the people. But I didn't do it because of the fear of God. You know, I'm a little, I don't know how to say, I don't know what. I know there's this big, oh, you shouldn't be afraid of God. I'm afraid of God. I mean, I know God loves me. I know that he is perfect in everything, in his judgment, in his wisdom, in his mercy, in his grace. I mean, in everything, in his anger. But I don't want to stand before him someday ashamed. I don't want to stand before him someday and have him say to me, you let me down. I gave you this opportunity. I gave you this and you let me down. Jesus said to those who were listening to him, you ought to fear God, the one who can cast your, your soul into hell. And so usually you hear people who they don't have any faith in Christ, they don't believe like we believe, but they're the ones who, what is, what's this fear of God? Why should I be afraid of God? Isn't God love? Yeah, God, is, God loves you so much that he sent his son to take your place and to take your penalty upon himself, penalty for your sins and mine, he paid it all so that you don't have to. But if you reject that, you are rejecting God's love and his plan for you, and there's only one choice for him when you die. And he doesn't want that. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yeah, God loves you so much. Look what he did. But he says, repent. And Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all perish, just like these people did. That's a good answer, by the way. (laughs) That's a good answer. They may not like it. But yeah, I don't want to stand before the Lord someday and not hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Man, I'm striving for that. The the people who say, give me a little little shack in the corner, back corner of heaven. Okay, I'll I'll take whatever. I, I know the Bible says there are mansions that Jesus is making for us in his Father's house, right? And I'm looking for, I'm hoping to get something like that. But if he gives me a little shack in the back corner of heaven, that's okay too. I just want to hear, well done. Man, I want to hear that. 
When I open my eyes, when I, when I close them for the last time and take my last breath and look upon Him, I want to hear, well done. The fear of God. Solomon, after he examined life from every angle in the book of Ecclesiastes, ended it with these words, Let's hear the conclusion to the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is man's all. This is the whole duty of man. This is what it's all about. Fear God. Fear God. Motivated by the fear of God. Once again, I want to quote Matthew Henry. If you walk in the fear of God, you won't be either covetous of worldly gain or cruel toward your brethren. Those who truly fear God will not dare to do anything cruel or unjust. So pursue repentance motivated by the fear of God and pursue repentance motivated by the best for my brothers. The best for others. And of course, our example for that is Jesus himself. Here's what Paul, uh, matter of fact, I'm going to read the passage in Philippians chapter 2. Some of you know that this is probably my favorite passage in all the Bible. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, let nothing be done through strife, selfish ambition, or conceit, But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And then he goes into this great passage. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And we just sang about bowing to that name. Paul is saying, have the same mindset and the same attitude that Jesus had who had all the splendors of heaven and glory and 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 honor and the throne and he had it all but willingly set it all aside and came to earth as a servant as a man and died for you and for me. Didn't have to. Didn't have to. But he did it willingly. And the mindset that we are supposed to have is that I am willing to sacrifice myself for the good of others, for the well-being of others. I can honestly tell you today that I'm, I'm better at that than I used to be, but I still have a long way to go. And I won't ask for a show of hands who, of, of who's with me on that. <laughs> Others first. Others first. You want to have a great marriage? Follow that. Follow that. You want to have a great friendship? Follow that. You want to have a great church? Follow that. Pursue repentance, motivated by the fear of God, motivated by the best for my brothers, and motivated by the perception of others. I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, church, those of you watching at home, what other people think matters. 
Now, remember, I, you say, well, wait a minute, I just remember not long ago you, you said, uh, like Paul, it is a light thing that I should be judged of you. Get, get the picture here. Nehemiah said, should we not live in the fear of God because of the nations, our enemies? Because they're watching what we're doing? And you've heard me say this time and time again, that people are watching us. When you tell people that you are a Christian, that you believe the Bible, they probably don't know anything about it. Maybe they know a couple of the commandments, but they're watching. There's this innate understanding to a certain degree, of right from wrong. And when we begin to behave like they do, they scratch their heads. They go, wait a second, this isn't lining up with what you said, with who you said you are. And we need to be very careful about that. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 2 to the church at Rome, he said, You're so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. He was talking to the Jewish believers there, right? Who were, they were all puffed up about, uh, they follow the law. He said, no wonder the scriptures say, the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. God forbid that because of our behavior, people reject God. Now, if they reject God because they don't like our holiness, that's on them. But if they reject God because we are not living that lifestyle, that we are not the walking Bible, right? Isn't that what Paul said to the church at Corinth? Paraphrase, in essence, you may be the only Bible that people ever read. It's so true. It's so true. My heart breaks. I am grieved over and over again when I hear about churches that are just imploding because of conflict, because of sin in the church, because of whether it's a a, a congregational leader or a group within the church, and it's just these factions, and, and it's like, come on, folks. There is something so much bigger. The the world is watching. And they're not going to turn to Christ because of what they see. And that's a shame. And that's on God's people. Point out the offense. Pursue repentance, provoke by example. Provoke by example. In verse 10, and then the final verses, we read Nehemiah saying, hey, this is what we did. This is what I did or didn't do. And what he says is, I didn't follow the example of those who went before me and took advantage of the people that they were supposed to be helping. Oh, I wish our politicians could read this and and abide by it. Nehemiah said, listen, I was there for 12 years and I didn't once take the provisions that I could have taken that were supposed to be for the governor not like the ones before me did, and their servants even took advantage of the people. He said, I didn't take anything from anybody. And in fact, he said to these, these people that he was you know, a little upset with, he said, I have been redeeming people from the nations. I've been paying to redeem some of our brothers from our enemies who they had to sell themselves into slavery in order to, in order to uh, uh, buy food. 
He said, I'm paying to redeem them and you're sending them back. And then in those last few verses, Nehemiah says, here's what I had to put out for food for all of the nobles and all of the leaders on a daily basis. And I did not once take anything from the treasury. I didn't once take anything from anybody. And I love the way he ends it. Remember me, my God, for good according to all that I have done for this people. All that I have done for this people. You want Nehemiah for president, please. And Congress. Every seat. Give us a government full of Nehemiahs who would say it's not about me and about how rich I can get and about my name on buildings and, and bridges and, and about my legacy. It's about everyone else and doing what's best for them. And challenging folks saying, hey, follow my example. Follow my example. Think about this. My rights matter far less than people who are hurting. My rights matter less than people who are in need. And my comfort matters less than helping people. We've gotten it backwards. We're living in, in a backwards, upside-down world and society that says it's all about me, me first. And that has crept into our churches. And when we look at Philippians chapter 2, when we look at Nehemiah's example, we understand it's not about me first, it's about everyone else first. And God said this in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Let me set the stage and we'll, we'll finish up here in a moment. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, Eli was the priest and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were also priests at the temple and they were wicked. God called them corrupt. So corrupt that they were causing the people to not want to bring their offerings to the tabernacle. They were they were pushing people away from worshiping God by their behavior. And when Eli heard about it, he rebuked, he gave him a little slap on the back. You shouldn't do this. And he didn't stop them. They didn't listen. They kept doing their own thing. And so God sent a prophet to Eli to tell him that God is going to wipe out his whole family. And then he said this, Those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. I want to close before our invitation song with this thought. Please, honor God. Honor God by keeping His Word and walking closely with His precious Son and by loving one another. And if there's sin within your heart, and by the way, you know whether anybody else does. If there's sin within your heart, or within your family, or within your church, point out the offense, pursue repentance, and provoke others by your example. Our heads. I'm not going to look for a show of hands. just want you to answer this question in your heart, in your mind. Pastor, I know that I've trusted Jesus as my Savior, and I know I'm saved by grace through faith. But I know I've turned from His Word to walk in my own ways, to do and to have what I want. But my heart's gone cold, it's empty. My life has no fulfillment. 
And I want to turn back to him right now, today. Lord God, we humble ourselves before you today in this place. We thank you for your mercy. We beg you, Lord, for your spirit to renew us, to revive us, and to help us love you with all of our heart and to love others with Christ-like love and to serve you with all of our might. And Lord, it's my prayer and I hope everybody's prayer here that you would just light a fire in our hearts, a fire that would spread across our nation. And Lord God, that you would use us to show Jesus to a world that so desperately needs him, to show your love, your grace, your mercy, to touch others. Lord God, just to to be the, the kind of people who walk with you and live closely to your word and your son. And I pray it in his name. Amen.